Well, other sports that aren't in the public eye so much also have their world champions, and on quite a few occasions this year, Britain has supplied the best. Well, in football, it was a year when English clubs completed their return to European competition. Manchester United won one of them. This one, the Cup Winners' Cup. The Premier League is upon us, though quite what it means to the fans, nobody knows. And of course, the home countries were trying to qualify for next year's European finals in Sweden. But let's begin in North London, where as much was happening off the pitch as on it. In North London, they'd not seen a season like it for 20 years. The league championship came to Highbury and Spurs, Arsenal's financially stricken neighbours, lifted the FA Cup for a record eighth time. One man seemed to hold the answer to most of Tottenham's problems. It's going nowhere that attack, but it is now. Walsh, Gascoigne, it really is going somewhere now. It's a brilliant goal and that's what he can do. Is Gascoigne going to have a crack? He is, you know. Oh, I say! That is schoolboy's own stuff. If Paul Gascoigne was riveting in the semi-final, in the final he was reckless. His self-inflicted injury splintered his knee, jeopardised his career, and for a time threatened to be just as painful for Spurs. Stuart Pearce punished the tackle there and then. It was goodbye Gaza, and the move to Italy was on ice before he reached hospital. But without him, Spurs were inspired. And Paul Stewart with a chance for Spurs. And the equaliser! In goes Stewart. Oh, a chance at the far side. It's in! Brings it off a forest player. They say when the year ends in one, Spurs always win a cup. And after the hangover, came the takeover. Terry Venables and Alan Sugar bought control after seeing off an 11th hour bid from Robert Maxwell. And Spurs thought they had debts. 
The Rumbelows Cup was won by Sheffield Wednesday, with the manager proving the champagne to his liking. There's a reserve game <laughs> Anybody that soaks me is likely to be sub. <laughs> Once Wednesday's promotion celebration subsided, Atkinson preferred the vintage at Villa Park. But he wasn't the only manager to spring a surprise. Kenny Dalgleish sensationally walked out of Liverpool in February. Emotional exhaustion seemed the only plausible reason. What proved to be his last match in charge was certainly a draining experience, as Everton came from behind four times to haunt Liverpool in the FA Cup. Two days later, Dalgleish announced his shock resignation. Eight months later, he was back in football, as Blackburn Rovers made a bold bid to join next season's Premier League. The new man in the hot seat at Liverpool was Graham Souness, who broke the British transfer record when he paid £2.9 million for Dean Saunders. As Liverpool ended their six-year exile from Europe, Saunders came good with nine goals in his first three UEFA Cup matches, taking Liverpool into the quarter-finals. Good ball, Saunders, is it the hat-trick? Oh, that's the way to take them. The return of English clubs was heralded by Manchester United in the Cup Winners' Cup. They accounted for Barcelona in Rotterdam. Rodson. Hughes down the middle, no offside, the keeper's out of his area. Hughes kept his feet, but it's an acute angle. Oh, what a goal from Mark Hughes! It was the year of Brian Robson's international retirement after 90 caps. North of the border, the championship went to the last game when Mark Haightley's goals for Rangers pipped Aberdeen on the post. That made it a winning start for the new manager at Ibrox, Walter Smith. The Scottish Cup was a family affair. Tommy McLean's Motherwell beating his brother Jim's Dundee United in the final. On the international front, Wales threatened to send world champions Germany spinning out of the European Championship qualifiers. But Ian Rush's goal was more than wiped out in the return match, and now the Germans need only a draw against Luxembourg to qualify. A draw was what Andy Roxburgh's Scotland achieved in Bern against their main group rival Switzerland. The Scots fought back from two down at half-time. Dury! Brilliant save, but now, oh yes, it's 2-2! Two -two. So the Scots through to the finals for the first time. England will be in Sweden too, after remaining unbeaten along with the Republic of Ireland in a tight group that went right to the wire. In the end, the luck of the Irish ran out. And in Poland, where a draw was required, the launching pad called Gary Lineker again proved England's salvation. Up goes Mabbott. Lineker! Oh yes! It's there for England! It's Gary Lineker! We'll spare a thought tonight too for Gary and his family, I think. By the way, this is the uh, European trophy that England and Scotland will be trying to win next summer. Well, still plenty of sport, plenty of action that we haven't covered. For instance, it was World Championship year in swimming. British challengers were Nick Gillingham and Adrian Morehouse. Some top-class competition in Perth. Less than five feet above the platform and only 12 years old. But Fu Ming Zia of China was the best in the world. Adrian Morehouse almost defied age. Norbert Rosa had to break the world record to beat him. Two golds for Thomas Danyi, their first under two minutes in the 200 medley. Two golds and a silver for America's Janet Evans. And three golds for her compatriot Matt Biondi. In the Europeans, silver for Britain's Ian Wilson. And again behind Rosa for Morehouse. Nick Gillingham beat Rosa in the 200. Oxford won the boat race in the third fastest time. But sportsmanship came close to sinking. Charity, as usual, found its home in the London Marathon, a World Cup event for the first time. Among the wheelchair athletes, Farud Arush and Connie Hansen were the victors. Rosa Mota was again the marathon metronome, and Yakov Dolstikov gave a first to the Soviet Union. The team trophy went to Britain. For a change, our medals in the world judo, five for the women, included silver only for Karen Briggs. That was England's colour in world rugby too. No, this is the women's final in Cardiff, won by the United States. And these are American footballers' round ball style, winning the Women's World Cup 2-1 against Norway in China. Now 
Now there's a challenge to the All-American male in 1994. Netball's World Championships were Antipodean, a black ball final with Aussies beating Kiwis 53-52. The little white ball belonged to Penny Grice Whitaker, British Open champion. The England women's hockey team, with Jane Sixsmith on target, won the European Cup. And later in Auckland, Britain qualified for the Olympics. Bronze in Europe for England's men, with Sean Curley reaching a century of international goals. Lisa Opie, in her fifth final, at last won the British Open squash title. Yohangir Khan did it for the tenth successive time. But he lost in the World Open to Australia's Rodney Martin, who, having already beaten Yanshia, became the first to beat both Khans in one tournament. In show jumping, there was a sixth King George V Gold Cup for David Broom. Michael Whitaker on Henderson Monsanto won the Hickstead Derby. John on Henderson Milton retained the Volvo World Cup. In the Europeans, Frenchman Eric Nave was the victor, but his horse has since tested positive for drugs. Holland were team winners ahead of Britain, who later won the nation's cup. At badminton, Ian Stark had to settle for second, but on Glen Burnie led a 1-2-3 for Britain in the European three-day. The 500cc American duel at Donington. Swans won, Rainey had other days and took the world title. Miguel Indurain of Spain won the Tour de France. Chris Walker was the cream in the milk race, and the pursuit of Colin Sturgis made him first at home and third in the world. Sean Wallace pipped him for second. Salbach Hinterglem, skiing's world championships. Mark Girardelli won the slalom and later clinched the overall World Cup title for a fourth time. Petra Kronberger did the same, added the slalom World Cup for good measure and took gold in the championship downhill. Franz Heinzer of Switzerland did the downhill double, championship and cup. Chantal Bornison won the World Cup downhill and the World Championship combined. And Stefan Eberharter of Austria was the only skier to lead the championship with two golds. Pair skating remained a Soviet preserve, but new names, Miskatinuk and Dmitriev. Canada's Kurt Browning made it three worlds in a row. America provided the top three ladies, the winner, Christy Yamaguchi. And the French-Canadian sister and brother, Isabelle and Paul Duchesne, at last won over the judges in the dancing. She then married their choreographer, Christopher Dean. The Soviets still had their grip on men's gymnastics as well, keeping their world title and producing a new champion, Grigory Masutin. Neil Thomas was the first Briton in an apparatus final, and the team qualified for the Olympics. Kim Zemeskal gave the home crowd the first American women's champion and a 10 on vault. And the little Korean pop it on the bars, Kim Gwan Suk, with another perfect score, won everyone's heart. A new personality for gymnastics in 1991. Kim Gwang Suk, perfection at the World Championships and admiring her talent with us. Nelly Kim in this country, coaching at the moment. And she has produced perfection herself in the past. Nelly Kim, four times an Olympic champion, a world champion as well. You're the person to tell us exactly how good is Gwang Suk. Oh, it was wonderful when she did her exercise on the bar in world championship in this year. It was best exercise and she received the highest score. But same as uh, if you, we say if you want to win, you must show new elements or new exercise. Same as Olga Korbut and Nadia Kamanichi. Same as me, she did new in new element first in the world on the bar, and now we can we we have a new gymnastic star. Wonderful new star yes. as well. Now quite a few people seem to be coming out of retirement tonight, and we've got a a beam exercise set up here. Can we tempt you? Okay, I will. <laughs> 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 We would love to see it, that's for sure, but maybe tonight's not quite the right occasion. Yes. But, uh, <laughs> it's not so easy. It's not it so easy at all. Yes. We are going to put it to good use, though. Uh, it's a long way from Pyongyang to London. The journey took over a week, 
but she's made it. Four foot four, four and a half stone, the girl who looks set to be the star of next year's Olympics, Kim Guang Suk. That was absolutely stunning and it's wonderful to see you in London. Now the hardest part of the evening. I know your English is not too good, but you have got a little message for us. Thank you. Happy Christmas, Iburian. <laughs> and happy Christmas to you as well. Wang Suk, real star. My heart broken and yours too, I guess. Well, 25 years ago, England won the World Cup. This year, they nearly won the World Cup again. Of course, I'm talking about rugby union. And like their soccer counterparts of a quarter of a century ago, England's rugby heroes, while being panned by some of the critics, simply went on winning. Before we jog those memories, though, let's remind you that in rugby league, for one team, it was business as usual. One club dominated the rugby league year, Wigan. Hanley led them to a record fourth consecutive Challenge Cup and their Australian coach John Money got them through a gruelling climax to the season to retain the league championship. His witness counterpart Doug Lawton made the summer headlines crossing the Pennines to Leeds and immediately paying Wigan a world record £250,000 for Hanley. Wigan responded by beating the Australian champions Penrith to become world champions. And 1991 was an important year for Runcorn Highfield. They won their first match in 76 attempts. It was a quiet international year. Great Britain all but guaranteed a World Cup final place by beating Papua New Guinea, who were also beaten by a reformed Wales side, led by Jonathan Davis, now established as a world-class rugby league player. Davis had once led Welsh Union defiance in Cardiff, but now the bastion fell to the English for the first time in 28 years, an emotional occasion to open England's Grand Slam. Seven penalty goals for Hodgkinson and a forwards try. Keep going, Dewey is driving, and the try is scored. Marvellous positioning by Ray Maxon. It's Mike Deep who's done it. 
But if the England squad were jubilant, they weren't prepared to say so in what smacked of being a rather petty cash affair. But there was some silver in the offing as England prepared next to face a Scotland side, which had earlier dispatched Wales with graceful ease. So in winning back the Calcutta Cup from Scotland, there was special contentment for England. an impassioned Lansdowne Road crowd and Kieran Fitzgerald's Ireland between England and the first Triple Crown since 1980. Gagan's try to put Ireland ahead before the indomitable England pack finally wrested control. Hill, Andrew, Hodgkinson, Underwood cuts back inside. Still a horn, but he's got away. Underwood, Underwood going. He's got to make it. Underwood is there. Hill, Rob Andrew, Mike Teague, Mike Teague sails it, the acceleration of the certain victory. All set then for the perfect Grand Slam climax with all conquering France. And the incomparable Serge Blanco was the man who seemed to pose the greatest threat for England's captain, Will Carling. Maybe the one thing that, that I might be apprehensive about is, is Blanco, you know, it's his, uh, it's his last game quite convinced he'll want to be uh, remembered for it somehow. Blanco on the counter-attack, this is typical adventure. Binding mesmeric artistry, but not enough to deprive Carling's England of their gallant triumph. Hill, drop goal, Rob Andrew, that'll do. England again, Carling, Andrew, misses out Guscott straight to Hodgkinson, Rory Underwood round the outside, he's skated home, it's Rory Underwood. That is the Grand Slam moment for England. Mission accomplished, and England's first Grand Slam for 11 years. One for the records, but only a brief interlude for celebration. Carling's team next took the field in search of the ultimate prize, the World Cup, and New Zealand showed the measure of the task ahead. It's out to Kerwin, Kerwin is clear, almost at the line, gives it to Michael Jones, the first try of the game for the New Zealand flank forward. But against Wales, Western Samoa showed how the established order was changing and at Wales' expense in Cardiff, they took their place in the world's top eight. England came through their pool to meet France head-on. France lost theirs and the match. Julie takes it like candy from kids. It's moved to Carling who sends a long under. Guscott cuts through. Guscott, if he can keep on his feet, must score. Better still, he gives it to Underwood. For Ireland in their quarter-final with Australia, well, so nearly a dream fulfilled. Here comes Campese, he's obstructed, Clark, Clark picks it up, inside to Gordon Hamilton, Miles Hamilton got the legs, Hamilton going for the corner, Hamilton going for the corner, his momentum carries him over! But that was before the cruel awakening only moments later, as Campese left it to Michael Liner to take Australia through at the last gasp. In England's semi-final, Scotland were denied by the kick that counted most. Andrew, Andrew with the drop goal, it's clean through. It's a crucial kick by Rob Andrew. Second semi-final, New Zealand versus Australia, and a man apart, David Campese, an explosion waiting to happen. Well, I've been good. I knew that I wouldn't. I've been good. I knew that I wouldn't. So good. So good. I got a year. Campese, at one time the deadly finisher and the inspired creator, the artist. Campese picks it up. Oh, Campese could be in for a second. Campese outside to Horn. Horn going in. And the world champion Dwellen truly on the rack. It was to be a truly grand finale in that special rugby atmosphere, a royal occasion blending spine-tingling excitement with good-humoured rivalry. For the Aussie machine, a vital score. Gailey's driving now, they're over the line, the try is given. 
9-0 down, England fought back as they tried to beat Australia at their own game. For once, a desperate David Campese in defence. And then a try-saving tackle to remember from big John Eels to deny Rob Andrew and save the day. And the whistle goes, it's all over. And Australia have won the 1991 World Cup. A match of heroes on both sides, and no question the magnificent Wallabies were worthy of a triumph masterminded by Nick Farr-Jones. So much honour in victory and in defeat. Well, it was well deserved. It was a great run, Will. I wonder how much you were spurred on by the criticism you seem to be getting. You're winning all the matches, but there's a fair bit of criticism about the style of play all the way through. Well, I think people are entitled to their own opinion, but we got a, an awful lot of letters which were all supportive and very proud of us, and I think that's what we passed around and, and we enjoyed, so I think we, we tended to ignore the criticism. I'm smiling. <laughs> <laughs> what are the slot like to captain, then? We saw the team talks. <laughs> Oh, they're very good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a very experienced side. It doesn't take a lot of captaining. Um, you know, just a bit of fine-tuning, but it was great fun. Very, I'm very proud to do it. What was it like immediately after the final, though? That dressing room? Um, not a happy place. It was very sad. I mean, we, I think we played extremely well. It's one of the best games I think we've ever played. And yet we lost, and uh, there's not an awful lot you can say um, to a team like that. But. I think I was very proud of, of the way we played, I was very proud to be part of the team or the squad. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think we had a good run and uh, we did as, as much as we could. Indeed. Rob Andrews off to France, of course. Yep, moving over in January. Best yeah. place for him. <laughs> <laughs> work, work and play. Yeah, Best place for him, you <laughs> said. Um, you're, going to, you're going to play for Toulouse? Yes. And what right. about uh, your England prospects then? What does that mean? Well, I'm still very keen to play for England and, uh, you know, hopefully... Uh, come back um, during the Five Nations Championship uh, to play uh, with, with the side. Right. Now let's talk to the engine room, the guys who really matter, who do the real hard work. It's Mickey Skinner here. He's you around. mean the fat boys? He's looking around. around. The bigger chaps. The, boys, the yeah. bigger chaps. Yeah, the bigger fun. chaps. How tough was it all for you fellas? Well, I think as the, the girls, we call the girls the backs. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, they get, you know, they get the first interview, you know, Will, what was it like, what's it like to captain the team? Basically, the forwards get the hard work. Um, there's a place for fat boys in the England rugby team. And as you've seen in the cricket as well, there's one or two <laughs> fat boys there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, honestly, it was, you know, the backs keep us on the straight and narrow. Which was the toughest match? I saw you being a little bit shy and sen sensitive in that French game, for example. Uh, well, I don't understand French, so <laughs> I was sort of <laughs> listening in to what he was saying, actually. <laughs> well, uh, you had a tremendous run, and uh, many congratulations. Now, I'm pleased to welcome the number one star of the World Cup, David Campese is here. <coughs> Where is he? Talk to each other at all, do you? Oh, definitely, you know? yes. Yeah. All the time. Okay. Well, as I say, that uh, they had a little bit of flag, but um, what were they like to play against in that final? Because they could have won it. Yeah, actually, I was really worried in the last 20 minutes. I thought England played extremely well. Obviously, I put a lot of rubbish on them on the week before, and um, on the day, I think they proved, proved me wrong. They can play running rugby if, if they want to play it, and they played extremely well. And, of course, the Irish nearly did you. Yes, I know. I think it was um, one of our players, David Knox, didn't actually play in the tournament. And I said to him after the game, what were you thinking? He said, oh, my holiday's almost finished. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, we knew six minutes ago that we had a good team and we didn't panic and we wanted to score the tries and we did. How was the win received down home? I mean, you're based in Europe. I don't know if you've been back to Australia. Yeah, I, I did, yeah. yes. Uh, it was fantastic. I think the, um, <coughs> the amount of people that followed the game during the World Cup was uh, unbelievable, especially in places like Melbourne, Victoria, Adelaide different states where rugby's only played in New South Wales, Queensland, I think it was received very well. Right. Somebody told me you played today, is that right? No, I no. played yesterday. Yes. Played yesterday. Yeah. Duff information again. Oh, well, let's hear yeah, it. There we are. <laughs> Great. Thanks very much for coming. Ladies Thank and gentlemen, you. I can now tell you that uh, the BBC Team of the Year 
is the England Rugby Union squad. I'll ask David now to present the award to Will Carling. Will you do that? <laughs> yeah. I have to say, as far as our team award is concerned, we really do feel this year that there would be an injustice if one certain team was relegated to second place. So for the first time ever, we're presenting a joint Team of the Year award, and it goes to Britain's outstanding world champion relay team. Come on down, fellas. Just one second. <laughs> and to present their award, the man who held that long jump record for 23 years, Bob Beeman. Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who I A friendly, if rather chaotic, scene. And we're just a few minutes away now from announcing the 1991 Sports Personality of the Year. Before that, we must acknowledge a few other sporting moments. The kind of moments we always seem to associate with Murray Walker. Right into Russell, then the very tight hairpin breaking, and Jonathan's right up alongside Lincoln, and he's done it again! He's hit Nathan Lindgren, spins off! Well, what an absolute disaster for Jonathan Palmer and Nathan! She certainly doesn't look as though she thinks it was her fault. And she doesn't! Hell hath no fury like a woman ram! In boxing, Mickey Duff is one of the great leaders of men. The sport of baseball broke new barriers. There's such a thing in sport as beating yourself, of course. Football produced a new defensive technique. Boston Marathon turned into, well, a Boston crowd. Formal introduction here. Yes, this is Haley. Haley, hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> she thinks it's an ice cream. Because what can you do? You see, I'm just standing still at the traffic lights. This guy just comes piling into the back. <laughs> oh, hang on, mate. I'll sort you out. So I sort of get out of the car. You know, <laughs> stroll across. He's thinking, huh, I know this. This is Des. I went, you, right, mate. So I said, oh, pick him up, right? Excuse me. <laughs> okay. Because I'm mad when I'm roused, I tell you. He's a hospital man. <laughs> I'm happy. I'm now a way to get me suit measured. Yes! What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Missed it. He tried to step over the stumps and just flicked a bail with his, with his right he hand. He to try to do the splits over it and unfortunately uh, the inner part of his thigh must have just removed the bail. He just, just didn't quite get his leg over. Anyhow, he... he... <laughs> He did very well indeed, batting 131 minutes and hit three fours. Agus, do stop it. Um, Lawrence, uh, always entertaining, batting for 30, 35. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
35 minutes, it'll fall over the weed keepers. Hey, stop it. There's Lawrence. <laughs> well, Lawrence. Suit me well. He took four of the week he was dead. He was out from the eye. Tough looking. And in 12 minutes, there was caught by Haynes on Patson for two. And there were 54 extras. And he got them all out for 419. I've stopped laughing now. Yep. <laughs> You're all right now, Jonas? Just about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we now come to the major award, the 1991 BBC Sports Personality of the Year, voted for by you, the viewers, through your Radio Times coupons. Just before we make the announcement, a reminder of the main contenders. Now, to make the announcement of the BBC Television Sports Personality of the Year, please welcome the Director General of the BBC, Michael Checkland. This event is always a splendid and enjoyable occasion for the BBC to confirm its major commitment to sporting coverage of so many sports at local, national and international level. Uh, we've always felt it was our job at the BBC to bring the great sporting moments into your homes uh, and into the homes of listeners as well from our radio services. It's been important for the past of the BBC. It will be very important for the future of the BBC that we bring all these events to you. And we intend to you. We intend to bring the goals, the tries, the runs, the rounds, the finals, the gold medals, and all these great sporting moments and to celebrate the major sporting personalities of our time as we have done in the past. And you, the Radio Times readers, have voted uh, for the BBC Personalities of the Year. And in third place, we have, in reverse order, the Tottenham and England footballer, whose skill on the field of play is only matched on his dignity off it. Gary Lineker. Well, Gary, understandably, cannot be with us tonight, but I'm sure you'd wish me to send on all your behalves, both here in the studio and at home, our very best wishes to him and to his family. And I'd like to ask his Tottenham friend over many years and his teammate, Gary Mabbott, to accept the prize on his behalf. And in second place, the captain of the Grand Slam winning rugby team, World Cup finalist, Will Carling. And finally, the winner of the BBC Sports Personality of the Year for 1991. An outstanding athlete whose performance in the World Championship in Tokyo on a torrid night, as David Coleman described it, was one of sport's finest moments. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please show your appreciation for a very fine winner, Liz McColgan.
Well, I'd just like to say that I'm very, very honoured and a personal thank you to each and every viewer that actually took time out and voted for me. It's been a great year for me and I've uh, had a lot of excitement, but this award tonight really tops the bill because it is, is from the general view in public and it means so much more to actually get an award from the public. I've got lots of people to thank. Um, the list is a mile long, but I'll try and cut it short. Uh, obviously, my immediate family, I thank very much for their love and support. And a lot of thanks goes to my husband, who is now my coach, and he's put 100% behind me, and there's no way that I would be accepting an award like this today if it wasn't for him. So 50% of this award goes to him as well as to me. And I'd just like to thank the BBC for giving us the, the chance to have this awards presentation. And I'm very, very honoured, and thanks to the viewing public again. Thanks. <coughs> The 1991 BBC Television Sports Personality of the Year is Liz McColgan. From all of us, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.